Stand with me, please. Everybody standing in the presence of Almighty God. Our hallelujahs belong to Him. And indeed, He deserves it. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, our God is worthy. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Let everything that hath breath praise the name of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We are greatly privileged to be able to gather in this place to worship the Lord God Almighty in spirit and in truth. As we acknowledge the presence of God, we also Acknowledge all of the reverend clergy and to the deacons and deaconess trustees, to the choir and usher and all of you, my heavenly father's children. No place I'd rather be than right here worshiping our God. No place I'd rather be than gathered together with the saints of God. Some who have come through trials, some through tribulations, 
some who have come up the hills and some who have crossed through the valleys. But look at you. You're here. You've made it. And we're mighty glad and grateful for all that God has done. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you, God, for an opportunity to hear a word from you. We trust that you will speak to us now. Give us an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say. And bless this, your humble servant, we ask. Give me strength where I'm weak. In the matchless and marvelous name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Those of you with your Bibles, would you turn kindly with me, please, to the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse number 56. I want to read just the B portion of that verse from the King James Version. Matthew 26, verse 56b from the King James Version. The sacred writing reads, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Those of you that have stood for the reading of the word may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Jesus had warned his disciples of the day that they would come and that they would leave him. He had warned them that this day was pending and that soon it would come and now it has arrived. He had walked with them, he had prayed with them, ate with them, taught them the things of God, shown them the miracle working power he possessed defended them, encouraged them, loved them, cared for them, and even revealed to them the glory of God that dwelled within him. Yet when it came time for Jesus to be offered up, he said to his followers, his faithful twelve, you all will forsake me. You will all leave me. You will all turn and run from me. To which Peter responded and said, we will never ever abandon you. We will stay with you forever, even if forever means death. So that as we look at Jesus and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, there is divine orchestration in the text. God is pulling all that ever was and all that will ever be into redemptive alignment with all that the scriptures had said at this one moment in time. God was up to something. He was brewing some divine activity. God was working on something as when a detrimental or calamitous situation or event arising from the powerful combined effect of a unique set of circumstances works to create the perfect storm as here God's working on a divine composition where his only son will be offered and the shepherd shall be slain and the sheep shall be scattered. Look at him in the garden. Jesus has finished the feast. He and his disciples had gone into the Mount of Olives singing and he says to them, all of you shall be offended by me tonight. Peter says, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Jesus looks at him square in the eye, sizes him up for who he really is, and says to Peter, verily I say unto you, Peter, that before the rooster crows and before morning comes, you shall deny me three times. They stand in the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus' soul gets very sorrowful and he asks Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, to come and pray with him. He prays that prayer, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but, but thy will be done. Turns around and finds his inner circle sleeping. Awakes them and says, rise, let us be going. 
Behold, he is at hand that does betray me. And while he yet spake, the Bible says, Lo, Judas, one of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude, with him with swords and with staves, from the chief priest and the elders. Judas comes near Jesus, moving with singular purpose, gets close to Jesus and says, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And it is in that scene that the forecast of Jesus is fulfilled and the army that came to arrest him grabs Jesus and takes him away. And right there, the disciples, Jesus' friends, the ones that he had been with for three and a half years, the ones that he had said, though I should die with thee, yet will I deny thee. They all forsook him and they fled. The New International Version says, Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The New Living Translation says, At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. The Berean Literal Bible says, Then the disciples all, having forsaken him, fled. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. God's word translation says, then all the disciples abandoned him and ran away. Well, no matter how you say it, it still comes down to one thing. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. I want to focus on fickled friends. Say fickled friends. Uh, that is uh, his disciples, his friends turned their back on him. They fled, they ran, they abandoned Jesus, they forsook him and ran away. The scene is this, and it is the last time in this pericope that gets my attention. It's the last line in this passage of scripture that really grabs me because it says, Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. It is that line that has me in its grip this morning. His disciples left him. His boys ran away. Uh, the men that he had walked with and sat with and ate with for three and a half years have deserted him. What a commentary on a relationship that has developed to this. That all the years Jesus has invested in them, has taught them and lived with them and shared with them has come down to this desertion that after all they have been through and everything they have seen and, and all they have done the final words to the emotional strain is that they deserted him and fled his boys left him hanging as one writer says, the cruelty of all this is um, that it would be hard to exaggerate. Rhonda, you can't make this up. For more than three years, their divine master had been building up their faith and binding them uh, to himself by his teaching and his example. Uh, they had witnessed his miracles. They had heard his discourses. Uh, they had experienced his favors. They had been made the objects of his priceless love. The end is at last approaching. The end of his life is near. The extremity of suffering and the severest brunt of the conflict with the unseen world is even now at hand. He has washed their feet. He has made them partakers of his body and of his blood. He has prepared them for danger and even more, he has made them privy to his own mysterious need of support and consolation, even of their human sympathy. He has exposed to them his secret sense of loneliness and desertion. And when our Savior Savior needed them the most. They were nowhere around. They fled. They ran away. They abandoned him. Ah, but don't judge them because when God has needed us the most, um, I need to tell you and serve notice this morning uh, that so many of us have forsaken him as well. Uh, we have fled and run the other way. We have abandoned our mission. We have forsaken our position. We have run away from our service and fled uh, from our assignment. Don't judge 
them because we have been none the better. God has needed us the most to uphold the cause of Christ. We decided it was too much for us to handle and we went in the other direction. When God needed us, he looked around and we were nowhere to be found. Oh, I'm not talking about anybody. I'm just serving notice because when God needed us, where were we when he needed somebody to visit the sick, when he needed somebody to go to the hospital, when he needed somebody to see about those in prison, when he needed somebody to mentor the young, when he needed somebody to be the example, when he needed somebody to see about the poor, where were we? In so many instances, we were running in the other direction. We fled, fled, fled. As though by the capture of the leader, the whole enterprise had failed. Cicero said, Quanti in periculis fugi proximorum. What unfaithfulness is to be found among friends. What unfaithfulness is to be found among friends? Oh, I've come to discover Deacon Darby in my 55 years of living that friends can be so fickle. Changing frequently, shifting loyalties, fluctuating interests, unstable in their affections. Fickle friends are as good as long as we've got something to offer or something to give. But when the stuff goes down and the enemy surfaces and conflict comes and disturbance arises, even our best friends have a tendency to run. As long as we have goods, the fish and the loaves, the miraculous meals, the healing and the helping, friends would be around. But when the difficulties appear, fickle friends will disappear on you. Fickle friends will leave you to yourself. Fickle friends will walk out on you and leave you to handle the situation all by yourself. But I don't need fickle friends. I need a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. I need a friend who will be there with me through thick and thin. I need a friend that will walk with me and that will talk with me. I need a friend that will be with me until the end. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. I wish this was a praying church. Because you know what we call those kind of friends that leave you when you need them the most? In the urban vernacular, we call them not friends, but we call them frenemies. Yeah, it's a friend who makes plans to hang out but cancels when a better offer comes along. It's a friend who helped you through a bad breakup uh, then started to mess with your ex. It is a friend who stands with you when you have uh, but runs out on you uh, when everything is gone. To sociologists and psychologists, these problematic folk are known as ambivalent friends. They are friends that act like enemies and enemies that act like friends. They are friends that boost you up only to bring, listen, only to bring you down. They include the well-meaning friend who is overly competitive, the person who is a pillar of support when times are tough but can't quite uh, take pleasure in your own success. It is your homeboy that drops everything to lend you a hand when you need one only to talk about you when you ain't around. I don't know if any of you have frenemies. Uh, I don't know if any of you have frenemies, but, but they're there and they're in everybody's life. And you gotta, you got to beware of them. Frenemies are folk who drive you nuts. You love them, but you don't want to lose them. But they're more problematic than they are supportive. 
May I just suggest this before I drop into the text? Because, because, because some people aren't loyal to you. They are just loyal to their need of you. Stay with me. I'm just going to talk to you this morning. Uh, because some people aren't loyal to you. They are just loyal to their need of you. And once their need changes, so does their loyalty. They are just using you for what you can do for them. But when you can't do for them anymore, it's deuces, I'm out, I'll see you later. And it doesn't matter if they are family or neighbors or church members or folk you met yesterday or someone you've known all your life. They are only as loyal to you as you are to meeting their need. And they are loyal to their need of you. The Bible says, then they forsook him and fled. Watch this. At that point, they abandoned him and ran away. Why was it at that particular time that the disciples forsook him and fled? Well, then, the Bible says, then all the disciples left him and fled. Watch this. Why then? Why then? At that particular time, it could have been what certainly must have appeared to the disciples as the most impractical way in which Christ met the crisis and challenge of that hour. He had rejected any fighting. Instead, he directed an appeal to the multitude, which was useless. Kaufman said the Jerusalem rabble was as irresponsible as the Parisian mob during the terror, and the disciples knew it. Christ also knew it, but his words were directed not to the moment, but to the centuries. It was important for all generations to know of the dastardly conduct of the plotters against the Savior and of the wretched mob that arrested him. Christ apostles were not yet children of the ages. They were only children of the hour. Therefore, they acted upon the hour's impulse and not the age's impulse and they fled. And I have to ask you, have we left Jesus for the hour or have we committed to him for the ages? Because if all you see in front of you right now is what's going on in your life, the peril you're experiencing, the crisis of the moment, then you will miss something greater that God has in mind. You've got to look beyond the hour and see God is doing a work for the ages. You've got to move beyond where you are right now and know that everything that you're going through, it's working for a divine plan. There is a destiny at stake and God is doing something miraculous in your life. Don't get upset by what's going on in the moment, but trust God. Believe God that whatever you're going through. God is working it out. There is a divine plan and a divine purpose that he has in mind for your life. Because do you not understand that true friendship isn't about being there when it is convenient. It is about being there when it's not. Oh, I wish I could get one amen. True friendship isn't about being there when it is convenient. It is about being there when it's not convenient because a lot of us because a lot of us a lot of us we want a convenient God we want a convenient God. In fact, we want a convenient Jesus. We want a convenient pastor. We want a convenient deacon. We want a convenient church. We want a convenient ministry. But what happens when you have to serve God when it's not convenient for you? Uh, then what? If my Christianity becomes inconvenient, then I'll pick it back up when my schedule and my finances and my time will accommodate it. We still saying I am a friend of God but if the truth be told too many believers are his friend when it's convenient for you. But what happens if it makes it change your schedule? What happens if God gets deeper in your pocket? What happens when you gotta go out of your way? What happens? What happens when serving God becomes inconvenient for you? Do you stay with the program? Do you walk with Jesus or do you turn? Ah. And walk away. Do we become a part of the number of disciples 
that fled and deserted him. What happens when, when it doesn't fit your schedule when serving God is not on your agenda for the day, yet God interrupts your schedule and your calendar and says, I've got an assignment for you. Do you sit back and say, God, I'm sorry, I don't have time for you? Or do you move everything out of the way and say like Isaiah, here am I. Send me. We have become a society of accommodation. We want everything to fit nicely into our little schedules and on our little agendas. Ah, but Deacon Darby, I'm glad my God didn't approach the redemptive plan for us as a matter of convenience. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad God didn't approach salvation as a matter of convenience. We would have never gotten saved. Uh, listen, redemption was not a matter of convenience for God. Uh, it was not a matter of convenience for God, but it was a matter of sacrifice for God. It was not convenient for God to send his son uh, down through 40 and two generations uh, to save a wretch like you and a wretch like me. It was not convenient for God to send his son and wrap him in swaddling clothes and tabernacle among men for 33 and a half years to save us. But I'm so glad he didn't go on convenience. He went on sacrifice. He went on sacrifice. So that I have just two questions to raise this morning out of the text. I have um, just two questions to raise this morning out of the text and then I'll be out of your way. And the first is, why did they leave him? And the second is, where did they go? Mm, stay with me. Walk with me through the text just a half a second here. Uh, because the Bible says, uh, then all of the disciples forsook him and fled. Watch, not only went away from him and not only left him alone as he said they would, but they ran away from him like nervous sheep, the shepherd being about to be smitten and they fearing lest Peter's rash action should be imputed to them all, having cut off one of the soldier's ears and they suffer for it, or lest they should be laid hold on next and bound as their master was recently. Everything in this account is an aggravation of their cowardice, as that they were the disciples of Christ that forsook him, whom he had called and sent forth as his apostles to preach the gospel and to whom he had given extraordinary gifts and powers who had forsaken all and followed him and had been with him from the beginning, had heard all his excellent discourses and had seen all his miracles. And yet these are the very ones that forsake him and even all of them run away. John, the beloved disciple, ups and leaves. The one that leaned upon his bosom that same night at the Last Supper, he left him. Peter, that professed so much to love him and had such zeal for him and faith in him of the three that had just seen him in his agony, sweating and praying like great drops of blood. And every one of them left him. Not one of them stood by him. And this too, after they had had a fresh instance of his power in striking the men when he spoke to the ground. Uh, they left him in the midst of his enemies. They left him in the midst of his distress and in his trouble. So why did they desert him? And I have many suggestions, but let me just label one. And I want to suggest they left him because of their fear. They were afraid that they would meet the same fate as their master. 
After all, Peter had just cut off one of the soldiers' ears and Jesus had put it back on and they were afraid that one of the soldiers would retaliate in turn. I agree with Barnes that these disciples were overcome with fear when they saw their master actually taken alarm with the terrific appearance of armed men and torches in a dark night and forgetting their promises not to forsake him. They all left their savior to go alone to trial and to death. Uh, and don't look at them funny. Because how many of us, when their connection to Jesus would lead them to danger, how many of us have left him and fled? The disciples left. But the Gospel of Mark includes an interesting editorial. Stay with me, please. It includes an interesting editorial that M Matthew omits in the same scene because the gospel of Mark adds something that Matthew doesn't and it adds the fact that after watch this I'm getting ready to mess with you I'm gonna warn you in advance because afterwards uh, the disciples left and had fled Mark tells us that a young man um, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body attempted to follow Jesus after all of this other disciples left there was some lad some young man Man that came and just hurried up and threw a cloth around him a linen cloth and he left following after Jesus we are told we are not told who he was or where he came from or what connection he has to Jesus some scholars suggest he may have been the owner of the garden and a friend of Jesus but nevertheless aroused by the noise from his repose he came to defend or at least to follow after the Savior he cast in his hurry such a covering as would at hand around his naked body and came to follow Jesus. The young men among the Romans and the Jews attempted watch this to seize him and Mark tells us that when they grabbed him um, they left him uh, totally naked because they pulled the linen cloth off of him and he continued to follow after Jesus and my point is are you willing to get stripped of all you are uh, to follow after Jesus? How much are you willing to give up for the Lord or to run after him how sold out are you or to run after Jesus how much are you willing to give up to follow after him because the sad commentary on 21st century Christians uh, is this, uh, that we ain't willing to give up nothing uh, to follow after him. But I think we need to take a page uh, out of this young man's book. Uh, and if it takes everything I am, if it takes everything I want to be, I'm willing to get naked for God. I'm willing to be stripped uh, of every ambition, every goal, every objective, uh, everything I want to be, everything I want to do, everything I have, everything I want to have, every possession every dream I'm willing to get stripped of it all just to follow him I stand like the apostle Paul and say what things were gained to me I count them all as dung I count them all as manure to win the Christ in my life it means nothing to me you can have the world but give me but give me, but give me. You can have the houses, you can have the lands, you can have the cars, you can have the yachts, you can have the jewelry, you can have the diamonds, you can have the gold, you can have the furs, but give, but just give me, just, Give me Jesus. Because my grandma used to say, if I got Jesus, uh, I got enough. You can have the houses and everything else. Just give me Jesus. Uh, uh, watch the text. Because the Bible would suggest that in fear, uh -huh, they fled. And here's a point worth noting. Don't skip it. Because I would ask them, um, brothers, Simon and Peter and um, Nathaniel and Bartholomew and Philip and 
John and Peter and James. Um, um, uh, could you come here for a minute, please? Um, could you just huddle up on the stage with me? Could you cuddle up right here on the baptismal pool? Could you just, could you just stand on the baptistry for a moment? Because I got a serious question to ask you. Um, brothers, could you just stand beside me this morning? Because I, I got to ask you a question. And the question I need to ask you is, mm, uh, what are, uh, are you afraid of? Uh, what's the problem? Why why you want to run? Don't you know uh, who you're standing with? Don't you know uh, who's standing there? Don't you know um, that he is uh, the king? of kings and uh, um, that he is uh, of the Lord of lords uh, uh, do you not realize that the word uh, uh, became flesh uh, and dwelt among us uh, and we beheld his glory uh, do you not know who you're standing with Peter or uh, do you not know who you're standing with Nathaniel and Bartholomew and Philip uh, or do you not know who this is and in case you don't know he's already uh, he's already told you he said, Peter, put up your sword. Ain't time to fight. What's going to be has to be. He said, but listen, Peter, if it was necessary, he said, I have enough power and enough authority right now that I could call not one. I could call not two, but I could call 12 legion of angels. Now before you shout, do the math. Before you shout, do the math. Before you shout, do the math. Because scholars suggest that a legion is anywhere between three and six thousand. Uh, listen to me, they're between three and six thousand. So that at a minimum, do the math, if he was to call twelve Deacon Roberts, legion of angels, he would have thirty-six thousand at least. Thirty-six, listen, he would have at least thirty-six thousand angels show up at his side. But at the maximum end, he would have, if it was 6,000 per legion, he would have 72, listen, 72,000 angels come swooping in. Come swooping in to rescue him. And what are you afraid of because the same Jesus that stood in that garden um, do you not know the same Jesus has the same authority that when you are in distress and when you are in trouble uh, we serve the same Jesus that he could call to your beck and call and he would send angels uh, to come to your rescue or uh, he would send the angels to come uh, and to be by your side uh, all night and all day I got angels mm. hang on hang on hang on hang on hang on Hang on, I got to quit. Because there's a second question I need to ask, and I'm just about ready to get out of your way. Because the second question is, if they're going to leave Jesus, I want to raise the question, Peter. They're still standing with me. So I got to raise the question, Peter. I got to ask you, Nathaniel and Philip and Bartholomew and James and John. I got to ask you, boys, um, if you're going to leave Jesus, I need to ask, mm -hmm, where y'all? I need to ask. Where y'all going? Where you headed? Can you find in this world a better place to be than with, thank you, sister. My help is coming from up above. Can you find a better place to be than with Jesus? And I want to argue and suggest today that there's no better place to be in this world than with Jesus. Uh, you might try down Mayor Perduto's office, uh, uh, but it ain't better than being with Jesus. Uh, you might try over at the governor's mansion and sit with Wolf, uh, uh, but there's no place better than Jesus. Uh, you might want to go down, or maybe not, down the Oval Office uh, and sit in Trump's office, uh, uh, but there is uh, no place better. Uh, 
than Jesus. Somebody say why. Somebody say why like you mean it. Because can't nobody do you like Jesus?